He spoke of having about a hundred revelations about this youth movement that was going to be raised up in Kansas City. A hundred different revelations from 1975 to 1983. And of course, that's not an actual number. That was just a, a number he would say. I met Bob's former pastor, one of them. There were several of them. In, a, in the church he was at, and at a pastor's meeting, a citywide pastor's meeting, and I said, hey, I met a man named Bob Jones. Do you know him? He says, of course. I said, what do you think about him? He said, he's a uh, true prophet of God. I said, well, he's been coming over to our church the last uh, few months. I, are, are you okay with that? He said, he told us publicly that in the spring of 83, when a group of young people came to Kansas City preaching on intercession and revival, that he would have to go. He said he told us that before he left. And so uh, I bless it. And that was uh, just an interesting interchange with uh, another pastor. Well, Bob's first, we're going to look at four experiences that Bob had that relate to this movement. The first one, his most, uh, I mean, the initial one, his first uh, 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 prophetic experience was in August 8th, 1975. He sees the young adult movement for the first time. Now, the context is that Bob is prophesying against abortion. And after this session, uh, but we're going to see a video of Bob. He's going to talk a little bit more detail about this experience with his own words. The Lord said, prophesy against abortion. And a demon appeared to him. Said, if you do, I'll kill you. Bob laughed at the demon. He said, in the name of Jesus, you have no authority over me. He prophesied on against abortion. And suddenly he began to hemorrhage, became very sick. And he, he actually had a death experience. And his spirit went to stand before the Lord. And the Lord told him, he says, I'm sending you back for souls. And I'm sending you back to touch some leaders of a youth movement I'm going to raise up in Kansas City. That's the essence of what he told him. Well, Bob comes back, and the the experience he had before the Lord is quite dramatic, and he tells a bit about it in this video that's coming in just a few moments. That as Bob comes back, his spirit's about to re-enter his body, he sees these two large angels, and they were talking to one another about the move of the Holy Spirit in Kansas City in the days to come. Paragraph B, I'm going to take some of Bob's own words from uh, former transcripts. I have quite a few different times he told the story. I just took them word for word. He said the Lord told him, paragraph B, in the last days, he's standing before the Lord before he's sent back from death. He said, I'm going to anoint some young people in Kansas City. I want you to go back to touch them. Some of these leaders who will, will reveal me to the nations. He said, I will send these leaders to you. He said, Bob, there's coming a third world war. It will wake up the nations when it comes. And I'm going to bring a bill, over a billion souls to me in the last days. He said, and I'm preparing my church to receive these billion souls and to labor with me in them. Number one paragraph, Bob continues. He said, the Lord said, many of my servants have sold out my glory for sin. They're called, they're anointed, but they've sold out my glory to walk in sin. But the time is coming close. I'm going to raise up young people that will be faithful to me all the days of their life. Now, of course, he's raising them up all through Asia, Latin America, and Africa, and Europe, and the islands, and all through the nations. But he was speaking to Bob specifically about a city, though this could be said, of many cities of the earth. The Lord said, I'm going to raise up some young people. They will be faithful to me till the end. Number two, Bob said, I looked at my body. He's about to re-enter his body because he's still with an angel bringing his spirit back. And he said, I saw two great angels. And he's looking at his sick body. And one angel, the angels were talking to each other, not really, not even to him. He was, he said, I was, I was eavesdropping. They were prophesying over Kansas City and I was next to them looking at my body, but I was listening to them talk. They were prophesying. Of course, it was meant for him to, him to hear them. One angel said, look. And so I looked down to the can- downtown Kansas City. I saw a great explosion of the light of the glory of God. And it broke out in the inner city. It was a crystal light that was traveling at the speed of light to the nations of the earth. Obviously, this will involve media. 
Paragraph 3, the angel prophesied and said to the other one, to the other angel, see, it has begun. And one angel said, yes, as it always must begin in the heart of a man, so Kansas City is the heart of this nation. A great move of the Spirit will begin here in Kansas City in the Truman Sports Complex. Of course, we have this certain association or identification in the Spirit with Harry S. Truman. I, I'm sure there, that's a real limited thing. I don't know what his spiritual life was like, but particularly because of his standing for the nation of Israel. And the stadium is named after him, and that's where this one dimension of this outpouring in the Kansas City area will begin. I'm sure there will be several beginning points. Then the angel told Bob, you won't be in Kansas City when it all happens, when it comes to fullness. But you will see the beginning of it. Bob told me that. That made my heart sad. He said that a couple times, particularly in interviews when we were interviewing him before different congregations or leadership teams. The angel said, I'm going to bring the first leaders of this light explosion. I'm going to bring them to you. You're going to touch the beginning of the leadership. Another angel said, look, see those who will sing. The first anointing is going to be upon the prophetic singers and the musicians. The angel said, look, Bob, look at those who sing. Then the angel said that multitudes will come to Kansas City because it will be a house of prophecy called the house of prayer. It's an interesting phrase. It will be a house of prophecy called the house of prayer. Paragraph 5, they went on to talk about finances. And the one angel speaking to the other and said, God's going to send finances to Kansas City beyond anything that they can understand. And Bob was speaking about himself now. He goes, anything that I could understand or we would at that time. You'll be a city where people will form a partnership with God. And they'll let God do anything with the money that God wants them to do. And so God will prosper them beyond anything we've ever seen in the past. Again, this could be said of other cities as well. Paragraph 6. Kansas City, the angel said, would be a world center to export natural bread or grain, as well as spiritual bread. There will be a shipping center for grain in the future. Because food, the angel said, will be one of the primary factors in the last days. And God's going to put godly leaders, the angel said, in charge of the movement of natural bread in the time of famine in the days ahead. And God has chosen this city to bless many nations. Number 7, paragraph 7. The angel said Kansas City is a city people can flee to and they can find refuge in the last days, safety. Great famine will come forth around the earth. There will be a third world war, a great world war. The angels showed Bob uh, that there would be uh, strategic or various geographic areas around the nation. And of course this would be true of the nations of the world. And part of the encouragement of this testimony for people in other places is... This is the sort of thing God is doing in the cities of the earth. He's separating them. He's preparing people in those cities ahead of time. We're just one, uh, just small little example of a little bit of that. We need to do it a lot better. And the Lord's doing this in other cities. And so hopefully this will be an encouragement to the body of Christ in other places. Paragraph 8. Bob said, I asked the Lord, how could this be? How could all of these things be? This great prosperity, this bread being shipped out to the nations from the Kansas City area and the 500-mile radius. The angels spoke about the 500-mile radius a number of times of Kansas City. And the Lord said over and over, it's because those who pray will receive from my hand. He said it over and over, because those that will pray, they will receive from my hand. And those that don't pray, they won't receive. Intercession will release the natural rain. Intercession will release the spiritual rain. And then the angel said, God's going to raise up a people in Kansas City who will pray for the rain. And therefore, they will pray, they will believe, and will, will receive, and the rains will come in an hour of trouble. The Lord showed him a banner over the city and even over the Midwest. It had uh, prophetic and intercession, which spoke of an abundant grace to operate in prophetic and intercession. Of course, that releases the power of God. The angel showed Bob at least five other cities 
in America that would have unusual protection and unusual power. Of course, he didn't say only five, so as intercessors, we're going to ask him for 500. If he says at least five, let's go for 500. And cities, but the, the point is, God will appoint cities based on prayer and his sovereign decrees, but those decrees are related to prayer. Wherever houses of prayer are being raised up, I don't mean houses of prayer that look like ours or even are associated with us. I'm talking about prayer ministries. Those, that's, those are indications of cities that will have unusual protection and provision in the future. Whatever you do, build houses of prayer. Again, many styles, many different ways and models to do it that God is breathing on across the earth. We're just one little style, one little way. There's a many, many ways that the Lord is establishing in the, in the body of Christ and the nations today in terms of prayer. Roman numeral three. Now we're going to move on to the next experience or the next dramatic one I want to highlight. He's had quite a few in between these. It's interesting. It is again on August 8th, which is it's strange. I asked Bob, why August 8th? Who knows for sure? That's my answer. He said on August 8th, he saw a white horse in the middle of a riverbed. And this white horse, which speaks of this young adult movement, was in the middle of a riverbed. A riverbed. It had, that riverbed had four inches of water, and it had... Rabbit dogs, or dogs with rabies on both sides of the river, barking at this horse. But the dogs wouldn't get in the river. Because dogs with rabies, I've been told, don't like to get into water. Paragraph B, it's in this vision, and we're going to give a few of Bob's own words. And again, at the video that's coming in a few moments, he'll give even uh, details on this as well. The Lord lets him know that he has an assignment. He's going to help the beginning leadership of this young adult movement that's represented by this white horse. And the Lord said, assignment, he says, keep this white horse in the middle of the stream. Don't let the white horse go to the right or the left because the dogs will bite the the, the white horse. And I describe what it means in this parable that the dogs will bite it. I have quite a bit on that. Paragraph C, the dogs... They speak of religious leaders that do not see the value of what God's doing in this hour. I'm talking about, in our context, this would mean, again, a parable you can apply many different ways. But in our context, this relates to those four values that God gave us in Cairo. That God gave me in Cairo for this movement. And I've talked to leaders over the nations. And the as I would have to testify that Bob is accurate In the 25 plus years, the number one point of resistance I get over and over and over by good people who love Jesus, good leaders. These four standards, I call them heart standards. Again, there's there's 20, whatever the number values in in a New Testament church. These are not the only values in the New Testament church. These are the values that are most neglected, most easily explained away by the body of Christ today. But over the years, constantly, leaders are saying, these are too extreme. They're unnecessary. It's legalism. It's just ridiculous. It's elitism. No, no, stop it, stop it, stop it. Because it was about living simple lifestyles, taking less to give more to the gospel. Yeah, but what about the blessing of God? Well, we can get blessed. We can get billions. Let's just give it to the gospel. I believe for billions. I just want to give it to the gospel, to to the harvest. To the prayer movement and the harvest, which is synonymous, two sides of one coin. Well, holiness of heart, what about grace? Well, grace is to establish holiness, not to give us a way to feel comfortable in our sin. Night and day prayer, yeah, we got to be practical. You know, there are other things. God said night and day prayer. The move of the Holy Spirit, standing for what the Spirit is saying or doing and bearing the reproach for standing Now, many leaders buy into those, and many buy into part of them, and many buy into none of them. But for 25 years, with friends, with godly leaders that I really respect, this is the point of contention over and over. It's too extreme. It's unnecessary. Dial it down. And Bob over and over would have words and say, do not listen. You must uphold these four things. You must. You cannot 
Go to the right or the left in this stream because these rabid dogs, these dogs will bite you. They will infect you with their thinking. He said this young adult movement must be built on these four things. Beloved, this is so important. God sent a man back from death as a prophet to keep this in place until it was established. Top of page three. Now here's Bob's own words. And we won't look at all of this, but you can, I, I left some so you could read it on your own to kind of fill in the blanks. Now it's interesting that Bob was interceding to stop abortion when this visitation comes. In August 8th, 75, the vision we just looked at, August 8th, 82, the vision we're looking at now, the two experiences. By the way, these are more than visions. They were full experiences. When I would ask Bob, was that a dream? He'd say, no. I hear a vision? He goes, no. I said, well what, well, what was it? He goes, I was there. I said, where? He goes, I was there. And that always kind of bothered me. And he said, but when you go there, you'll know what I'm talking about. He said, that's all I could say. It wasn't a vision, it wasn't a dream. It, it ex- I, yeah, I experienced it. And, of course, that's what happened in the two August 8th appointments. In both of them, he was praying and prophesying about abortion. This is not an insignificant issue. We'll look at that in just a few moments. Suddenly, as he's crying out for abortion, against abortion, the Lord appears to him. And he said, Bob, the white horse is coming. This is a group that I'm going to use in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Bob says, I saw a young group of people. He goes, I actually saw them this time. Because he had heard about them and seen different things. But in this one, he saw them in a more distinct way. Some of the faces he talks about. And the Lord said to him, I love this. You're going to love this because he's talking about you. The Lord Jesus is talking to Bob face to face. He goes, look at them real close. I want you to know, Bob, that I love them. I want you to know that. Over and over, he would tell me, I love these young people who are coming. And he said, my lightning will be in their hands. That's an interesting phrase. The Lord said this, my lightning will be in their hands and gave Bob Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4, which is actually a verse about the Lord. But of course, if it's a verse about him, he can apply a portion of it to anyone he wants. It's his verse. But in context... Habakkuk 3, 4 is talking about Jesus in power, operating in power at the time of the second coming. But there will be groups in whom this anointing of power and healing will be released. The Lord told Bob, my lightning will be in their hands. Number one, paragraph one under that, Bob on the notes here, Bob said, the Lord showed me like people in an audience. And the people in a vast audience... <clears throat> they would see the, 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 the uh, singers, musicians, the preachers, whatever. They would raise their hand on the platform, and in the vast audience, the people in the audience would see light come out of their hands and touch their bodies in the place where they were sick. Bob said it was the most remarkable thing. He goes, a man, the light would touch him on his abdomen, and he, would, he had no kidney, or he didn't had a kidney problem. He would be given new kidneys. Light would touch their eyes. Suddenly, blind eyes would open. Light would touch a missing limb. It would grow out instantly. The Lord showed Bob. He goes, this is the level of the anointing I'm going to be releasing before my return. Now, again, the Lord's talking to Bob about this group. This level of power, we're going to see this wherever the people of God press into him according to to God's standards anywhere across the nations. This is available for the people of God. Paragraph 2, the Lord says, Bob, I want you to set, I'm setting you behind them. I want you to watch their backs. I don't want the mad dogs to bite them. Now, that's a parable. Now, remember in our last session, it says in Matthew 13, Jesus spoke in many parables, and beloved, he still speaks in parables. I prefer the straightforward talk, but he talks in parables constantly. And one of the reasons he talks in parables, as I said last night, to make truth clear to the humble and the hungry, and to make truth obscure to those that are proud and self-satisfied, so they can't understand it. 
And the thing about a parable is that the more that it, as the years unfold, more and more levels of meaning unfold with it. And a, a parable has that dimension, a story. 10, 20, 30 years later, we look back and say, oh, how could we have known back then that this would have played into the storyline? The Lord said, I want you to keep, I'm still in paragraph 2, middle of page 3, I want you to keep the white horse in the middle of the stream. Keep him in the middle of the stream, and I'll do the rest. If they simply stay true to what I've told them, they stay in the middle, and they don't listen to the religious warnings and accusations. Because we can always be, uh, we need to be teachable. We need to be, uh, have a teachable spirit and be easy to correct by anybody. But that's different than yielding to intimidation to let go of these standards. Bob said, you keep them in the stream, I'll do the rest, Bob. Number three, Bob said, those that stand on the side, these leaders, they warn, they accuse constantly. But Bob said, as long as you stay in the stream, as long as you keep doing these four standards... You keep your eyes on Jesus. You don't be intimidated. You don't fall into insecurity. You don't yield and give up your vision because you're afraid they're going to accuse you and people are going to get mad at you. And you get insecure. If you don't do that, you can stay steady. Paragraph 6. Now, this is really personal. The Lord says to Bob, I'm going to release on Bob specifically a spirit of prophecy. Now, I'm going to give you a spirit of prophecy. Of course, he was operating in a significant spirit of prophecy at that time. But I'm going to give you particularly to help this white horse. That's your assignment. To stay in the middle of the stream. Bob said, the Lord said, I'd give you whatever revelation was needed to keep them in the middle of the stream. It happened so many times. Like I, I, I could give you a, a, a long list of examples. I used to tell them in the early days. But there's so many more stories to tell now. But I remember a godly man came to me in the early days. And he said, Mike, I, I love you. I appreciate you. But you really need to back off on a couple of these things. we got to be practical. I mean, let's be practical about real life. And this really isn't that practical. He says, but I'm behind you and I'm with you no matter what. And on and on. And I went, wow, you know, it, it was a very good appeal. Bob calls me on the phone. He says, the Lord showed me. That a man who stood among the oaks of righteousness, a righteous man, he just talked to you. And he warned you. And he pleaded with you to back down. The Lord says, it's not my counsel. It's not my will. Do not back down. I went, whoa, I just had that conversation. We're on our way to a citywide pastor's meeting. We're in the car and Bob says to me, by the way, when you get there, some guy's going to come to you. He's going to give you a, a prophecy. And it's going to be about backing down. I can tell you what it's going to be about. He says, don't buy into it. It's a leech. Again, speaking a parable language that will like suck the blood from you. So I go there and a guy comes up a really, you know, just a real cool guy and just says, hi, how you doing? Complimentary. You know, I just love your ministry, but the Lord showed me you're supposed to, you know, liberate the people and let them blah, 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 blah. In other words, don't do these four things. Bob was standing right next to the guy and he winked at me. The, Bob, the guy leaves, he goes, throw it away. Don't even waste a minute on it. It's not from God. It's from his humanist, humanistic reasoning. He's actually reasoning to justify his own lifestyle. He said, don't buy into it. Stay steady. They don't have any way of knowing. Of course, neither do I. In any kind of complete way, what, how important these four standards are and what God would do uh, uh, if we stay steady to them. He, I could give you many examples uh, of situations when Bob would come and tell me things like this. Top of page four. Just to make the record clear, paragraph F. I won't go into detail right now on this, but I just want to mention it. In 1996, I was rebuked for the very thing, for stumbling to the fear of man. The Lord made it very clear, and I confessed it publicly. And our leadership team, I said, we're guilty. We actually did it, but we did it. We confessed it in, in the early stages of it. 
And the Lord made clear that if we would not have owned that and confessed that and, and distanced ourselves from that, Fear of man, which was based on intimidation and insecurity, trying to make other leaders appreciate what we were doing, so backing down. If we would not have confessed that, there would be no IHOP today. So even after all of these warnings and all this divine help, I still stumbled. But it was a short stumble, and I'm not saying that to justify me. My point is, the Lord recovered it and said, there's grace if you'll yield and, and uh, if you'll admit and repent. So that, it was a big event. And I I can imagine from the heavenly point of view, it was a close call. I mean, like, we really were in the balance in that season. We were becoming more acceptable in a larger number. And as the our ministry was going forth in many places, more and more people were coming, and we were I was toning down the offensive part of these four standards. I believed them, I preached them to our own congregation, to myself, but I toned them down. And the Lord said, that's called the fear of man. I said, I thought it was humility. He said, it's the fear of man. Speak them boldly, tenderly, in humility, but boldly. Paragraph G, God is constantly calling IHOP back to IHOP. And what I mean by calling IHOP back to IHOP, us, IHOP, the prayer ministry, back to those four values, I H O P. I, intercession, H, holiness, O, offering to the poor, extravagant giving to the poor, and P, the prophetic ministry, uh, uh, standing boldly on what the Spirit says and does with the Spirit of faith and believing for His intervention. Interesting, paragraph H, I found out later that August 8th, this is when, this, it's when Truman signed the charter to establish the United Nations. Another thing that happened on August 8th, I don't have on the notes, in 96, Augustine, the prophetic man in the early days, he died on August 8th. This August 8th, I don't have, I don't really know what that means, but that date just keeps showing up like several other dates do. It's that parable, it's that poetic, parabolic ways of God. There's, God has divine poetry in how he leads. Precision truth in context with divine poetry as he leads history. You have to be really smart to do that. Okay, we're going to go to the next experience. This is the most dramatic experience I've ever had in my life. Bob had an experience and I had an experience. So I'm going to take the most time on this and then I'll give one more after this that's real short. There was a procession that Bob witnessed in the spirit going down Blue Ridge. Let's just read it. Paragraph A. On July 3rd, 1984. Bob was, I said, a vision. He goes, no. I go, a dream. He goes, no. I go, where? He goes, I was there. Bob was never uh, thought of as a theologian, although he's a very devoted man to the Word of God. He spends hours a day in the Word for 30 years. Hours a day in the Word. He is a Word man. But he's not a theologian in the way that we would think of, uh, of a theologian. But he is a word man, I have to say that, because sometimes we say prophets, they don't really get the Bible. This man is hours a day in the Word. I'm talking 30 years, that kind of lifestyle. So Bob says, I was there. He says, I was uh, witnessing a great procession going down Blue Ridge. Now, those of us here in IHOP in this building, Blue Ridge... 50 yards away. He saw it right there at that corner, 50 yards from this building. Now, that's exciting today. But in 1984, our church was 20 minutes away. I had never seen Blue Ridge on that corner. I had no idea. I, I, you know, when he said Blue Ridge, and I go, whatever, over there somewhere. He goes, we're going to be there. Now, again, it's obvious we're here. But in that day, it was like, Bob, I don't really think our Overland Park, upper middle class congregation, is going to move to Grandview. I don't really see that happening. And Bob says, I promise you it will happen. You will be next to Harry S. Truman. Of course, most of you know that Harry S. Truman, he had two homes, one Independence, one here in Grandview. It's only a couple hundred yards from here, right there on Blue Ridge. And that was part of it. Going past Harry S. Truman's property, the property that now, part of it, we now own, on the way to the Harry S. Truman or the Truman Sports Complex to the big stadium, I'm guessing it's 10 miles. 
But there was a big, I've never added it up, but there's a big procession of people. And what he sees in this procession is there's 30, 40, 50 young people. He says 35 when you talk to him, but he, he got the number 35 because the Lord spoke to them and said they would be, he spoke to them about the highway of holiness from Isaiah 35. And Bob saw highway of holiness, Isaiah 35. There's 35 of them. But he saw a company of young people. And God anointed them with apostolic power, with power to preach the gospel and to heal the sick like the apostles in the book of Acts. And whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, we don't know. Or whether that's the entire number, we don't know. But that's the, that's the group he saw. And they were at the front of this big parade. And all the people in the, in the parade on the street were the people that were healed by their ministry. There were thousands of them. The man would be pushing the wheelchair. He was in it, but now he's healed. He's pushing it. The other guy's carrying his crutches. They were showing, they, they, they were displaying their healing by carrying or showing the, uh, the uh, different equipment that was a part of helping them before they were healed. There were thousands and thousands of people walking down the street. And the Lord was at the head of the company. And this company of 30, 40 people were carrying the Lord on their shoulders like in the days of old when In David's day, they carried the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. And the Lord was being carried because they were lifting him high, high and lifted up. And they were on their way to Arrowhead Stadium to have a great meeting in the power of God. And there were thousands on each side of the road cheering them in this healing parade, so to speak, this gospel parade. And many were on the sideline praising the Lord. Only the people that were healed were were in in the actual parade and these 30, 40 people. Young people that God would anoint. Paragraph B. Bob's on the side. He's not in the parade, and he's not one of the 30 or 40 leading it. And he's an angel is sitting next to us, standing next to him. And he looks down, and he has a hospital gown on. And when he told me the next day, he goes, that perplexed me. I had a hospital gown on when this was breaking forth. And then the Lord spoke to Bob and said, and I don't know if it was the Lord through the angel or the Lord, you know, being carried on high. He just said, and the Lord spoke and said, I'm going to reveal this to Mike Bickle. I'm going to reveal this group, this group of young people that would be anointed with signs and wonders in the future. Now, everybody has the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If they love the name of Jesus, there's an anointing that every believer has by virtue of being born again. But there's greater grace. The Bible talks about many times greater grace. There's greater measures. And these, this company of young people had a measure of authority and power that was not just by faith, it was being manifest. I mean, the lame were walking on a regular basis. And the Lord tells Bob, I'm going to visit Mike Bickle And I'm going to share, I'm going to show him this. This company of people, or or this, what's happening here. Now Bob's own words, paragraph D. He says in the middle of the paragraph, he goes, these were the ones that will bear the government in this movement, this future movement. These are the ones that will keep me high and lifted up. Of course, they were carrying him like on the Ark of the Covenant. They were lifting him up. And the Lord says, from this position of being carried by these 30, 40 young people, and of course, in the, that's in the parable sense, they're carrying his presence in the actual sense, in an unusual measure, because every believer carries his presence. But the Lord says, these young ones, these are the ones that I'm going to bring up. I'm going to release apostolic power like, like they had in the book of Acts, was the idea. And Bob says, I walked funny. My feet were crippled. And the Lord speaks to him and says, you're, Mephib- you're like Mephibosheth. And you can read more about that. Mephibosheth was crippled. And he, Bob had a hospital gown on, and he's on the sidelines. Top of page five. Number two, the Lord said, but I want to tell you, Bob, about these young people that I'm bringing in. These are Bob's own words. They will not be crippled. They will not be crippled. And the Lord said to him, Pray Psalm 12, verse 1, and cry, Help, Lord, 
for the godly man perishes or cry, help, Lord. We don't have any champions who will lift only you up because the Lord had talked to him about so many of my servants. They sell out my glory. When I bless them, they begin to compromise. They keep the money. They go for the pride. They stumble in immorality. When I anoint them, they use it for other things. And I meant them to use it for the increase of my kingdom. Psalm 12, 1, the Lord said, pray, help, Lord, for the godly man perishes. Or pray, help, Lord, we don't have any champions. Those are, the, those are the ones that would lift the Lord up even with great prosperity, great power. They would never turn their eye to the right or to the left in their devotion. Beloved, I'm talking about some of you in this room and those that are even listening to this in the future. By DVD and CDs as this goes out to other places. Bob said, the Lord said to Bob, I'm going to answer that prayer. I'm going to answer that prayer. Paragraph three. Many leaders have brought shame by selling out to immorality, gold, or fame. But the Lord's going to raise up these young people. And again, this could be said in other cities and nations. God will have hundreds of millions of young people like this. Let's make sure they're numbered among us. Make sure you're one of them. It says, Bob, the Lord told Bob, they will serve the Lord all the days of their life. They will be faithful to the end. So Bob tells me this experience. He has it on July 4th, 3rd. On July 4th, he comes to me and he tells this whole, he says, Mike, you're about to have a visitation from the Lord. I'm talking about, you're going to go there. And he's going to show you this procession on Blue Ridge, these leaders, these young leaders that are coming. Again, we're still over in Overland Park, 20 minutes from here. I'm still not catching the Blue Ridge thing yet. The Grandview, Truman, I, I believe it, but I can't feel it. I can't get a sense for it. And, of course, the phrase I used to joke with is, Bob, our people in Overland Park, they don't really shop in Grandview. That's really not where our congregation Yes, but the Lord says, but this young people, they will fit in well there. These young people, they will do well there. Don't worry about it. Well, a month goes by. Augustine calls me on the phone about 1030 at night. I just came home from the evening prayer meeting, walk in the door. Augustine, hello? It's a month later. He said, the Lord promised you a visitation. I said, that's right. You're going to have it tonight. You know, like, how do you know? I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an intense statement. I'm going to have it tonight. You know? Yes. Very powerful prophetic person. But still, that's pretty intense. He said, I'm telling you, so when it's over, you'll look back and know that God even confirmed it beforehand. So I go to bed that night. Of course, Diane says, who is that? Augustine, what did he say? I don't know, can I go to heaven tonight or something? I don't know. I mean, it's like, I don't know how to say what he just said. So I go to bed that night, it happens. Bob Jones was right in July, a month earlier, and, Bob, and Augustine was right that night. I stood before the Lord in what Bob Jones called the courtroom of the Lord. Suddenly, I find myself, I, I go to bed, fall asleep. It starts off asleep, but it ends up awake. I end up awake. I see myself standing in this room. I have on the notes 20 by 30 feet. I don't know, 50 by 50. I don't know. You know, when you're in that kind of, you're not measuring. My point is it wouldn't have stadium. It was a, a room. And it's got clouds on the top, the bottom, and the sides. And I'm just standing there, and I'm touching my arms. And I'm going, I am not awake. I'm not, a, I'm not asleep. I mean, I'm wide awake. I go, I don't know where, what's happening. 
I'm in a room with clouds and I don't know how I got here. And I don't know what's happening. And I'm staring. I see nothing. And I'm touching myself, my fingers and my arms. And I go, I know that I'm awake. I, know, I kept saying, I know that I'm awake. I don't know where I am. I don't know how I got here. Suddenly. Oh, by the way, I'm going to read the verse. This is biblical. Because I really care that it's biblical. I don't want supernatural experiences that do not honor the written word of God. A lot of people have experiences as I'm not interested if it does not honor the written word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Paul the apostle said, I, had, I will come to visions and revelations. I know a man in Christ. 14 years ago, whether he was in the body, I don't know. Whether he was out of the body, I don't know. God only knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. I know such a man. He's talking about himself. He just, he can't let this go. He goes, whether in the body or out, I, I still don't know. The three times he goes, I, I don't know. And I think, I really grasp that. I mean, he says this three times. It's unusual. And he says it again. I was caught up. I mean, just the repetition of Paul in these four verses. Which incidentally, in the very chapter, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So I'm standing there. Before the Lord, paragraph F, and this is a weighty, terrifying, or, or painful, not terrifying, but painful statement. The Lord says, young man, and I'm at his left. I don't see him. I never turn to look at him. I'm looking ahead the whole time. This thunderous voice, young man, if you are impatient, you will cause great harm and much turmoil to many peoples. I thought, What? No, I really thought, what? I, I don't know what's happening. Where did, why did he say that? And I'm just looking forward, st straight ahead. I don't look. I'm mystified. A minute later, young man, stronger voice, louder. I mean, the first one was strong, louder, had a tone of correction, had a, a sternness in it of sorts, a tone of rebuke. Young man. You know, I'm just, if you are impatient, you will cause great harm and much turmoil to many peoples. And I'm going, I am getting rebuked. By then I know I'm in the presence of God. I mean, it's really clear. I can't figure out all that's happening. I go, why is he rebuking me? Because when he's talking about impatience, you know, I'm thinking of driving too fast. I'm thinking of, you know, getting mad at somebody, staying mad. I'm just impatient with that guy, so I'm going to get mad at him. I think, I don't do that. Well, I drive too fast, but I don't. I said, I don't, you know, write people off quick. I give people a lot of grace. I'm thinking of relational style, being patient with people's failures. And I'm thinking, I, and I said to myself, I, I don't agree with this. I think this thought. I don't say it. I don't know why he's talking to me so stern. But I kept saying, I said in my mind, he must be right. He's God. I really did. I go, he, he it has to be right. I just can't sort it out. Because I, I, I'm stuck on this idea of, I, I don't write people off. I'm rude. I, I give him a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance of, you know. I've been criticized giving him too many chances. I go, yeah, it has to be right. Now the third time. Young man. Oh, man. It's like piercing me. It's like going through my being. It's painful. I am hurting beyond measure. If you are impatient, you will cause great harm. You will cause much turmoil to many people. And I just started saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. I just started saying this and I was so much pain. And I'm completely confused as to why I'm getting rebuked. Suddenly, the clouds open and I start falling. And I'm falling, and I don't know where I'm falling. I'm touching my body. My body is my physical body. I'm touching it, and I'm only seeing dark. And I'm falling. And a moment later, I see lots of stars. And I think, where did the stars come? So where I started, was there were no stars. Then there's stars. A moment later, I look to my right, and the moon is right there, equal to where, me, you know, or however that goes. I mean, I looked right there. I looked at the moon. A moment later... 
I keep falling, and the moon's way above me in the vast star. I go, I am falling through the sky somehow. And the reason I'm telling you this, because uh, I didn't tell this for years, because it's so kind of eccentric sounding and bizarre, but the reason I'm t- saying it, because I think that many people are going to be having experience. They have to honor the Word of God. I mean, the, the heart of that experience, well, the whole thing has to honor the Word of God. But I, but I was so perplexed that without Bob Jones, I could not have made sense of this. And there's many people that are having experiences and will have them, and they don't have a Bob Jones standing next to them helping them. So I've hesitated saying it because people criticize it. It feels, you know, just really uh, stupid. You know, I'm at the neighborhood forum, the Grandview room, a couple hundred people asking questions about IHOP. One lady stands up and says, it was said you went to heaven. Is that true? And, of course, the whole room's looking at me. You went to heaven? I went, oh, man. You know, like, it's not the context I was expecting to talk about that. <laughs> I was thinking more of the 10-year anniversary. That's the place. And I just said, yes, I did, but this is in the context. She goes, no, I want to know what happened. You went to heaven? Of course, this whole room, half unbelievers, half not unbelievers, you know, whatever. So I just have hesitated, but I just feel the story of the Lord. There are many people there. They don't have a Bob Jones. I want them encouraged that I'm going to do unusual things in my spirit, that I want them to take seriously and not to write off. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll say these things. But as long as they're biblical experiences. So I'm falling. And, and what happens is then I look over my shoulder. And I see my duplex, the roof of it. I am falling through the sky. I I don't know if I'm in my body. I could feel my arms and I'm touching my arms all the time. I don't know. Paul said, I don't know if I was or not. I'm leaving it there. And, but I I remember I tightened up. I went, no, because I'm hitting the roof. I go, ah, and I go right through it. But I tightened and I'm wide awake. Now in my bed, I'm positive. I look at the clock. It's 2.15 in the morning. I see my shoes. I look at Diane, she's sleeping. I went, I said, intense. (laughs) No, I'm going, this is intense. I lay there. (sighs) You know, 1001, 1002. And suddenly the spirit picked me up. I went straight up again. I know I'm awake this time. And the moon is real high. And I'm watching it. I'm going straight up. Then it's equal. Then it's even. It's big and even. Then it's gone. And then I'm back up in the clouded courtroom. Bob called it the courtroom. And I'm there again. I know I'm awake this time. I'm touching my arms. I go, I know. I go, I do not know what's happening. But I was here a moment ago. And it was painful. It was not funny at all. I go, it was It was terrifying to me what happened. So suddenly, I'm standing there and I'm I'm just grieving from that experience. But I've had all this sensation of travel. The physical sensation of the whole experience now is real. And I'm standing there and suddenly, over at the left, there was an opening in this clouded room, this, you know, 30 by 30, 50 by 50 room, whatever the size was. It was a small room. It opened, and there was a chariot that came, came forth, a golden chariot. And the Lord said to me, get in it. And I'm transitioning from this severe rebuke to get in the chariot. And I walk over there, and I look at the chariot, and I fall to the ground, And I wept and I said, no, 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 I can't get in it. And the Lord says, get in it. It's been ordained for you. And I'm on the ground and I'm weeping. And I said, this is injustice. That a man like me could be in a chariot. This is injustice, meaning there's no way I could ever deserve this. And I was pained over the injustice of it. That my dedication could never measure this. Then two angels, P 
picked me up. I'm completely wrung out. Now I'm in pain on another entirely different way. I was in the pain of a rebuke. Now I'm in the pain of, it was an awful feeling. You think, well, they kind of the pain of humility. It didn't feel like humility. It felt really wrong to me for me to get in it. I remember, and I'm saying this, this might sound humorous, but it, it, I don't mean it to be. What I'm going to say next. That when Bob Jones says the Lord's going to take you face to face in July, now this is August, a month later, I am actually practicing in my brain, in my prayer times, I'm practicing. Elijah, Elisha, ask for the double. This isn't a time for false humility. When the king stood before Elisha and he hit the ground three times, some of you know the story. Elisha says, you should have hit it more. He should have hit it seven times. He only hit it three, so he only got three measures instead of a lot. I go, I'm going to hit that ground. I mean, this is not a time for false humility. And I'm practicing. I'm going to ask for the double anointing if I get a chance. You know, you don't know that you will. Anyway, I'm practicing this. And it's not to be proud. It's to not have false humility, which is really unbelief. And I was going, I'm going to do it so I get up there. And he says, get in it. And I don't say the double. I said, no, no, I can't. And I scream and say no. So then, as I'm in this chariot, it takes off and it goes into this vast blue expanse of just miles and miles. Or it's seemingly endless. It's vast blue sapphire expanse and my chariot is going into it and i'm clear it's the revelation of the knowledge of god because that's the agenda on the end time church the revelation of the knowledge of god ephesians 4 13 that god would bring us to the knowledge of the son of god as believers we would be brought to a deep knowledge of the son of god ephesians 4 13 and i'm aware this is the revelation of god that I'm going to have greater revelation. No matter how great your revelation is, when we get there, it will be a fraction of 1% of all that God has to say about himself. But I look over my shoulder because I hear a person crying out, no, no, behind me. So I look over my shoulder and I see a line of people and a line of chariots. And it was like the number Bob Jones said. It was more than 20, less than 50. I didn't count. I glanced. It was 20, 30, 40, 50 of them. And it was the group that Bob Jones told me about that the Lord revealed to him the month earlier on July 3rd. And they're young people. I don't know that they all were young people, but I know that most of them were. And I saw one, and he falls on the ground, and he cries, no. No, and the Lord says, get in. And he goes, no. And then I see the one behind him, the same thing. His chariot comes up and he goes, no, no. So I believe all 30 or 40 or whatever the number is. And again, that could be a beginning number. We don't want to work on that number. Some people, you know, they, they play off that number that. That's not the point of it at all. I know this, the ones that I saw, I could see no faces. But I know it's the young people, primarily the young people coming out of this movement. And there will be other appointments and commissionings for young people in the movements of the earth as well as the older ones as well. And I know that they are going to have the spirit of this cry. The the, the word in me was, it's injustice. It's injustice that I could have this calling. Because I knew it was a calling to move in apostolic power. The, the, to operate in the power the apostles did to preach the gospel, to heal the sick. I knew that, that that's what was happening. So then what happens, I go d- d- into this expanse. And suddenly, it's over. And I'm falling. And it's all black. And I said to myself, in a moment, there's going to be stars. A moment later, I saw the stars. And I said to myself, in a moment, there's going to be the moon. A moment later, there's the moon. Then I'm falling down in the sky, and the moon's way, stars are way above me at the top. The moon's real little far above. I look over my shoulder, just like the last time. I see the roof of our duplex. I did the same thing. I went, oh, I tighten my body. 
went right through the roof, wide awake on the bed, like last time, but I stayed, I laid there, I go, unbelievable. And I look at the clock, get this, it's still 2.15 in the morning. Now, I don't get that. I'm going with Paul. Whether in the body or out of the body, I have no idea. And the Lord wanted me to have the sensation of travel, the time, all of this, because he wanted me to know this was real. This was not a kind of an imaginary kind of mind's eye or dream state. This was a true experience. And the point of it being a true experience is not for my sake, just for my sake, though it's been a great encouragement to me. But I know, I know there is a movement. We were over in Overland Park. I knew there was a movement coming on Blue Ridge Road that would march by Harry S. Truman's property on the way to Arrowhead Stadium, and they would be people that Bob Jones received information about when the Lord spoke to him. They won't deny the Lord. They will keep him high and lifted up. They won't sell out the glory. They won't make compromises in immorality. They won't make compromises in money. It will all be the Lord's. They will have faith for billions so the harvest can go forth, not so they can have bigger houses. It's a whole different type of person. Using their faith to grow in love and to grow in power that the gospel would go forth in the nations. Not using their faith to get more stuff so they could just kind of coast between now and then. So I get up and I just go in the other room and I think, I just don't even know how to process what just happened. Top of page six. The Lord warned me about being impatient. Paragraph J. And again, those listening to this by DVD or the internet, these are all on the internet right now. These notes are. This is session two of an eight-session series we're going through of telling prophetic stories. And again, our point of these stories is to encourage people to press unto God, not to have a cool story. A cool story means nothing if it doesn't make us resolved in obedience and faith, steady and focused in our assignment. That's what the prophetic is about. Make us faithful and steady in our assignment so we don't go right or the left. We stay obedient to the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. Humility. We grow in love. We bring the gospel to the nations. That's what this is about. Now, the Lord said, be patient. Paragraph K, I want you to know that the word patience in the New Testament is often translated perseverance in many translations. Sometimes it's patience, sometimes it's perseverance. It means following through. What the Lord was saying to me, now I understand, I didn't understand it then. What he's saying, the main, undoubtedly he's saying several things. But the main thing he's saying above all the other secondary points of this exhortation, because there's always several levels to an exhortation when the Lord gives the exhortation. But he was saying, don't quit. He was saying, young man, if you quit, if you back away from these standards, it will cause harm. It will cause turmoil. You cannot back away. And because, now you don't have a heavenly experience because you get in a bad mood one Saturday and you want to back away. No, there's going to be pressure coming against this. There will be great pressure, even within the body of Christ, against this kind of lifestyle. Great pressure. He said, you cannot yield. That's what he was saying now, 25 years later. You can't yield to your flesh, and you can't yield to the criticism. You have to stay steady in these till the end. Or if you get in the middle of this and and yield to the fear of man or yield to just a lazy flesh lifestyle, you will cause turmoil to many people. Patience is the opposite of quitting. Patience means perseverance. Paragraph uh, L. I have observed, I'm going to say something really intense to you, and I want, it, I want you to feel the sting. That's what I'm going to say here. I have observed over the 25 plus years of preaching this, I have observed that most people that are enthusiastic, I mean, they're excited by this message. 
Most of them, it's not a scientific number. They, I mean the intense ones, they stay with it about five to seven years only. They stay with it for more than a year or two, more than a summer in Kansas City. They stay with it for four or five years, six, seven years. I've seen very few people stay with it for two decades, three decades. There are some, praise God, in the nations. I don't mean stay with our thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about stay with the high calling, the high a standard of an abandoned, a life of abandonment and obedience to God. That's what I'm talking about. Most people, they stay with it five, six, seven years. I'm talking about the intense ones. They're 22 years old. I mean, they're on fire. They get married next year. They get married and they make a covenant. And now they're 30. Now they're 35. And you can only see traces of these things in their lifestyle. Their testimony is the same, but the traces are... There's only traces of it in their actual, the way they spend time and money and what they do with their heart. They were so on fire. I've watched so many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds go through this. Every now and then, somebody will stay steady for a decade or two or three. I want you to know this. We're the 10-year anniversary, 10 anniversary at IHOP. Well, this is 27 years later. Do I have that right? I'm 83. Okay, something like that. 27 years later, this is the third group of people that I have given this testimony in a full auditorium. I gave this testimony in the 80s. The auditorium was this full, jammed. We made commitments and commitments and covenants to the Lord. We will go to the end. And Bob Jones was here. The prophetic is what happened. The vast majority of them have nothing to do with this. 25 years later. I mean, they love Jesus. But this four heart standards is cool. It's kind of Mike's thing. It's neat. We're glad he's doing it. We love Jesus. We love the prophetic. But hey, we've got to be practical. I mean, life, you've got to be practical. That was in the 80s. Then in the 90s, there's a turnover. The room is jammed again. I'm telling the story. The place is packed. It's a totally different group, about 90%. I don't know the number, but vastly different than 10 years earlier. Yes, to the end, to the end. Well, most of them, nowhere to be found in terms of pressing into this. Now, they might give verbal assent to the ideas, but I'm talking about what they do in their private life, the way they spend time, the dream of their heart, what they talk about and what they do, there's barely a trace of these things in their real life schedule checkbook kind of evidence that they're following it. So now we hear, this is the third group. This isn't my first time. And everyone's going, yes, yes. And I was saying, the spirit of faith, I believe it. But in a spirit also of reality, I say, yes, I've heard that twice before. And the room was full, and the room was fully sincere. So I hop, hope, help me up, uh, uphold these standards. Don't talk me out of them. Don't let me talk you out of them. Don't try to find a way to beat the system. Well, the leaders aren't looking. Let's do it different. Don't minimize them. These were spoken by God. These aren't, this isn't Mike's thing. Well, Mike does that. No, this is God's thing. And I'm a servant. I'm just sitting around the table like you. This isn't my idea. And he will not change these standards for anybody. Not for me. Not for you, not for anybody. And there will be great resistance. There will be great criticism. There will be the rolling of the eyes. Many false charges of the extreme accusations against these things. They're unnecessary. They're extreme. They're dangerous. They're damaging. What are you doing to people's real lives? What about the American dream? This is messing up the American dream in our young people. Yes, it is messing up the American dream. Because it's a heavenly vision. But I believe, I really mean this, that you really, many of you in this room will go the long haul. I really do believe this. Middle page six. It's come to the last few moments. The sands of time vision that Bob Jones had. Again, he said, this wasn't a vision, I was there. 
January 79. These are Bob's own words. And when I say Bob's own words, I've taken them from a transcription when he was giving a testimony of them. He gave this testimony several times. He said, the Lord took me in a vision to the sands by the sea. And he called it, the Lord called it the sands of time. Because the sea speaks of the nations of the earth in the Bible in, in symbolic language. The Lord said, in essence, like this is Bob, this is the sands of time. He interprets what's happening to Bob. And Bob said, so it's on this big sea. I mean, uh, this large beach, sand by the seashore. And I saw leaders through the generations. Now, of course, they're not physically there, but he's in the visionary kind of way that only the Holy Spirit understands how this works. We don't really get it. I saw leaders through the generations, and they were putting their hand into the sand. And they would find a box. They pulled the box out. And they were excited, and they opened the box, and the box was empty. The box was empty. And I heard them say, are the promises for now. And it was the promises of the end time glory of God. That's what the box spoke of in the boxes. It spoke of the promises of the end time move of God. And they opened the box and they were empty and it wasn't for their generation. Paragraph B, then the Lord tells Bob, put your hands right here, over here. And he points to a place. Reach down into the sands. But the Lord said the sands of time, using the symbolic language. Pull up a box. And Bob says, but Lord, I've already seen the others. The boxes are all empty. He said, do it, Bob. So he got a box and he opened it up. And the box was filled with letters. He said it was completely full. The number he talks about is 300,000 letters. Actually, that was in a different context, so that might not exactly mean this, as I'm uh, remembering it right now. He says, I was surprised to see this box. It was full of draft notices. He pulled one out, and on the letter, it had a person's name, and it said, Greetings. You have been drafted into the army of God. And he understood it was the end-time army of God. And the Lord says, I'm going to send out these draft notices. Again, the Lord speaks in parables. I don't know why the Lord speaks in parables. Except for he makes truth difficult. For the stubborn and the proud and the self-satisfied. And he makes truth simple and easy to those that are hungry. The Lord says, I'm going to send out these letters. In other words, I'm going to, I'm going to send the word out. I'm going to send the commission out to leaders. He says when it costs 20 cents to mail a stamp, and that was in 1981 to 1985, I have the details. I'm going to send out draft notices. I'm going to cause clarity to come. Now, most of you in this room were not even born then. So he was not talking about the whole entire army. He was talking about this initial installment of leaders. It's when they would receive clarity about their calling. There's many people around the world in that window of time they received a clarity about their calling related to the uniqueness of this generation. Paragraph D. Bob said, this will be the end time generation that's foreknown to inherit all things. But here's the key part where most of you come in. Because this initial leadership in the early 80s, and many godly men and women were called before and many called afterwards. Oh, by the way, it just comes to mind. Ten minutes ago, I just remember something from ten minutes ago. When Bob saw this 30 or 40 young people that were called with this apostolic power, he saw men and women. I want to say this. He said the Lord made it clear to him. It's men and women. Now that's a given to us. Of course we know the callings on men and women. But there's others outside of here. God is anointing women with apostolic callings not just men. Okay, let's come. That just struck my mind just a second. We're back to where I was a minute ago. Paragraph D, page 6. Bob, the Lord told him, he says, their children, the children of these people called in the 70s and 80s, their children will attain a level of the Spirit far beyond even their parents. And their grandchildren will surpass them. 
So when I first met Bob, he says, I'm very interested in your calling, young man. But he says, who I'm really interested in are your sons and their children. That's who I'm really interested in. Because Bob says, I won't be here when it all unfolds. I'll be here at the beginning, not just even in Kansas City. He goes, this is past my life. He told me I'm 27 years old. That's 27 years ago when he's telling me this. 1983, he goes, Mike, you will be one of the oldest people in this movement when this thing comes to, a, to the level. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, it's many years from now. It's beyond my day. Bob talked about a vision he had once. And he called it the Rose of Sharon. And I didn't understand this in 1983. He goes, I saw on my tombstone, I saw a tomb, a grave. It said, Bob Jones. I know it was past my time. And out of this was the most beautiful rose came out of my, uh, right where I was buried in the dirt. It was this beautiful rose. And the Lord said, that's the rose of Sharon. Bob says, after my time, the rose of Sharon will blossom. I remember this is 83. We, neither of us are thinking Song of Solomon, Bridal Paradigm. I go, what is that? He goes, I don't know. But the Lord told me that this movement will blossom into a beautiful rose with the fragrance that moves God's heart. Be beautiful to God. But it will be after my time. So, beloved, I'm not mostly, I, you know, Bob Jones was 53 when I met him. I'm 54. I'm older now than Bob Jones was when I messed him. You are now the young people. I'm the old guy. It's now reversed. I'm serious. My mission, keep you in the middle of the stream. I mean this. Your mission, 20, 30-year-olds, keep your children. They're the generation that I'm really focused on. If we do this thing right in the next 10, 20 years, we are going to have the table laid for my grandchildren that age. The ones that are one, two, three, four, five, the ones that won't be born for five or 10 years, that group will have a table to eat from if we are faithful in these decades. Bob, the Lord told Bob that these children and grandchildren, I'm talking about after those called in the 80s, Their children and grandchildren would be the best of all the bloodlines, of all their family heritages. They will operate in an obedience. The Lord said they will, told Bob, they will never, they won't deny the Lord. They will be faithful to him to the end. It doesn't mean they won't make mistakes. They won't sin. But when they sin, they will repent and get right back in the race. Not denying the Lord doesn't mean you won't sin. It means when you sin, you never make peace with the sin and go, I think I'll just do this for a year or two. When you sin, you stare at it, you declare war on it, you call it sin, you repent of it, you set your face the other way, and beloved, you're still faithful to the Lord. Meaning, you're still in the path of one of those that are not going to deny the Lord. Doesn't mean you won't stumble. It means when you stumble, you won't settle down and you won't make peace with stumbling. The Lord spoke the sands of time to Bob, and and here's what Bob said. He says, abortion became legal in 1973. This is why it was so important to Bob to prophesy against it. That he said, Satan is trying to kill the end-time children of promise. That when Moses was born, the devil raised up the killing of babies to cut off the deliverer, to try to cut off Moses. When Jesus was born, there was the killing of babies to cut off the deliverer. 2,000 years later, the most unprecedented slaughter of a generation. The devil is wanting to cut off a generation of promise because they will be deliverers. And that's why in both of those experiences, Bob was praying or prophesying against abortion. Amen and amen. 